The observer would like to advise that the following video comes with a trigger warning. The content in this video is of a sensitive nature, so please beware that the topic of this video may trigger you. The observer recommends that you consider your own mental health before you watch this video. Um, I really wish someone would have done to me. We're going to talk about baby P tonight. Um, I've never fully done his case before. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. But I think I came across an article earlier that I was reading, Hating Socks, and it talked about other people that had lost their lives um, in in the same area within a year of baby P dying and how they'd been failed. And it just kind of led me to think it was time to talk about baby P. Um, I understand some people can't stay. I understand it's going to be emotional. If people need to leave for a bit, I get it. Um, I'm going to be very careful about like pictures that I show and stuff like that. And obviously um, do it in a respectful way that tells his story without making it too sensationalized or, or picking on things that would really, really, really upset people. Um, but I think, um, thank you, Maxine. Thank you, Jules. Because I've had my channel now for nearly two years, in fe well, two years in February, the fact that I've never covered Baby P, but I always talk about him quite a lot, it feels like a bit of a disservice to him. So I think I am going to cover that case tonight um, and 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 talk talk about it. I can't believe it. It's her dad saying it was another child. I'm sorry. So Gemma, it's not him saying it. He says that Banash, um, Banash told him that another child killed Sarah which is why he took the blame which I don't even know if I believe any of that part of the story because you know you admitted it at one point now you're not it's just all really weird um I think baby P is a case that a lot of us kind of know roughly but not a lot of people know the ins and outs of baby P's case and I think um definitely researching those things that I kind of learned because like nearer to the like nearer to when it happened I kind of read certain parts and then thought oh, I can't read anymore um so we're going to kind of talk about it um, how many years do you think Sarah's brother will get? Sarah's brother's um, a child. Do you think, you mean his brother, Irfan's brother? Um, I don't know, because when I was looking at, I was writing out a timeline of um, the the um, the sentences in the baby P case today. I was like writing them out. And then I'd never really noticed that before how little time they got. Um, do you know what I mean? It, how little time they got for what they did. Um, and Sarah Sharif's case very similar, and I would hate if they got these, these kind of things. Oh, Chloe, I absolutely understand that. I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss of your twin babies as well. Like honestly, Chloe, um, and we'll see you tomorrow when I when I make sure I don't do a child case, because um, I know that we've done a lot recently. Um, so we'll cover something else tomorrow. Do you think it'll be? Under yeah, I do think it'll be under ten years. Unfortunately for the uncle, the justice system is so broken. Can everyone show Chloe some love in the comments, please, before she goes? Um, I can't imagine what you're going through, Chloe. If you need anything, reach out. I mean, honestly. Right, okay, let me just put a picture up. Um, we'll go for the picture that was everywhere because that will help um, people come in and not keep asking what case we're doing because it'll be obvious. Um, and we'll go through some more pictures as we go on. Um, yeah, so sorry if you lost Chloe. I know, bless him. So we're going to talk about a little bit about the background of his mother, of the other perpetrators involved, because I think it's important to to look into the kind of background, how we got to that point. Um, baby Peter's mother, Tracy Connolly, was born in Leicester, called Tracy Cox, in 1981, and her childhood was complicated and unsettled. Her mother, Mary, was a drug user and a drunk, and her relationship with Gary Cox, the man that Tracy had always believed was her father, was violent and abusive. I will do, Mamma Mia. Um, I've done it once before, but I can do it again. Their house was unhygienically dirty, and Connolly and her half-brother were unclean, unsupervised, and often bullied because of the state of them at school. Mary and Gary Cox separated in 1984, and Connolly and her mother moved to London, 
whilst her half-brother remained with Cox in Leicester. He's named Peter Connolly. At, age, at the age of 12, Mary informed her daughter she was in fact the product of a drunken one-night stand in Leicester with a married family friend called Richard Johnson and that Cox was not her father. Following the death of Gary Cox in 1988, Connolly's half-brother joined her and their mother in London and he had difficulty settling back into the family home and was reportedly violent at school and towards his half-sister at home. If Mary had moved to London in the hope of a better life, that was not the case for her children. One childhood friend from primary school remembers Connolly, saying she was the kid at school no one wanted to play with. She was plump, dirty and would turn up at school in shoes that were falling to bits and tracksuit bottoms that didn't fit. Children called her Tracy the Tramp because she was so scruffy. She was always getting beaten up by other kids and I remember seeing her at school once with a split lip. Connolly quickly developed a tough veneer. She learned to put up and shut up at school and at home, especially after she complained to her mother she was being physically abused by a close male relative, only to be accused of being a liar. Lonely, fatherless and lacking any self-esteem, Connolly went in search of whatever affection she could find. And from a young age, she was notably promiscuous and craved the, lack, uh, the attention from men as she'd never got it um, and never got it at home. Well done, Blue Sky. From 91 until June of 1992, Connolly was placed on the child protection register due to neglect through physical abuse was also suspected in the family home. Social services remained involved with the family and Connolly was sent to Farney Close Boarding School in West Sussex, catering for children with special educational needs and behavioural difficulties. She sat and passed GCSEs, including English and IT. And in these early dealings with social services, they are believed to have aided Connolly in learning how to deceive social workers and how to get away with things later on with their own child. And the reason I want to cover all these things is that I'm not making any excuses for it. The bitch is evil, let's face it. And, you know, you have two choices. You can either continue the cycle of abuse that you've witnessed yourself as a child, or you can go on to do better for your own children. And I'm sure most people in this room who've had a rough childhood have gone on to always do better for their own children. I think only by looking into backgrounds of people and learning kind of where they've come from and how we got to this point can we maybe stop the cycle in other families and kind of start noticing things it's really important but I always think when I'm explaining what she's been through people think oh you're making excuses for her but like, I make no excuses for her and when we get into what happened to baby Peter any sympathy I have for this little girl who used to be called Tracy the Tramp quite quickly descends into hatred um trust me but we can't ignore the fact of she was a product of her environment and was kind of always kind of going down a path of destruction, although it should never have got to this. And she was offered help on loads of different occasions. She was offered a life that was much different and Tracy was not going to do anything to kind of keep it. <clears throat> I might be in a storm, but I'll never let, I love that Lucy. I might be in a storm, but I'll never let my child get wet. After leaving school age 16, Connolly met Peter's father, a railway worker, then age 32, who could not be named for legal purposes. And well, I don't think to this day we know the father's name of baby Peter. A year passed before they moved into a council house in Tottenham, where Connolly gave birth to three daughters in quick succession before baby P arrived, being the fourth child. They married six years later in December of 2003, and Peter's father had no dealings with social services prior to becoming involved with Connolly. Hi everyone coming in. Peter was just three months old when Connolly split from the hus her husband amid rows over housework, or rather the fact that she wouldn't do any. So while he was working all day as a railway worker, he would come back and the house was getting filthier and filthier. And he kept saying to her, look, we can't have the kids being raised in this. Hey, love, sorry. We can't have the kids being raised in this kind of environment. Like we can't do that. And she was also spending a lot of her time online flirting with other men in chat rooms, pretending to be different women. Like that seemed to be her drive more than feeding the kids or looking after the house. Thank you. Um, and we see this pattern throughout her life, like what is important to her and it's not the children. Within three months of her husband leaving her because of this lack of housework, this lack of for life, flirting with other men, she had met 33 year old Stephen Barker, who she met while he was doing maintenance in one of her friend's flat and he quickly became her boyfriend. So I'm gonna show you a quick picture of Tracy and then of this new boyfriend, just play one more picture in the case. Thank you guys for the candles. So this is um, Baby P's mum. This is more the picture you'll recognise from when this all happened, when she was arrested. And this is her, where is he? This is her new boyfriend. Um, 
cold hearted motherfucker. Um, so by all accounts, Peter's natural father, his birth father is a loving father who was also duped by Tracy Connolly along with authorities. Peter's father repeatedly raised concerns about Peter's welfare after separating from Tracy and constantly went to the social services and asked for help. And that was Peter's birth father was saying like, she's not coping. She shouldn't have the children. They're not being looked after properly. There's things going on in the home. There was constantly kind of, he was prompting them to kind of help him and to do something. So we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm just going to put him up while we talk about him, despite the fact it's very disturbing, but because it makes sense, because then everyone knows who I'm talking about and which person. So born in June of 1976, the second eldest to five siblings and brought up in London, Barker went to a special school in Tottenham and had an IQ of about 60. Despite claims to be unable to read or write during the trial, police were able to prove otherwise through text messages sent from his device. Thank you, Queen Camille. Have a look. He was six foot four and 18 stone, a massive man. And he was obsessed with knives, martial art weapons and kept a crossbow as well as a collection of swastika memorabilia. He used to stride around his home in combat gear, always seemed really threatening. Hey, Mina. And he had a history, as we see in lots of killers, of enjoying hurting and torturing animals. From a young age, he enjoyed hurting any animal he could get his hand on. He loved torturing guinea pigs and frogs. He would skin frogs alive and then break their legs. And at the time of all of this happening, he chose to keep two pet snakes at Tracy Connolly's home with the children because he loved to kill the chicks and feed them to them. He would also kill mice and rabbits and, and feed them to um the snakes and it wasn't like a necessity like this is what I need to feed them this is like I'm really enjoying doing this and he would sit there for hours doing it his fascination with causing pain to animals eventually led him to be prosecuted for cruelty to animals by the RSPCA so this guy had a lot of warning signs in his past him and his brother Jason Owens who also features heavily in this case and this is Jason Owens here had previously escaped going on trial for the torture of their own grandmother, Hilda Barker, in an attempt to get her to change her will. They tortured her for hours, their own grandmother, birth grandmother, because they were trying to get her to change her will. But because she died of pneumonia before the case could go to court, the courts just dropped it. So these two had... Thank you, little Miss Axe, for her. Um, little Miss Axe, it doesn't even say for her. Um... These two had worked together, these brothers, to do horrendous things before. And the court, what really annoys me, right, you've dropped the case because there's no one there to give evidence to grandmother, even though you have her statement. And then you just allow them to move into homes with children without alerting anyone. Not that Tracy would have done anything. She wouldn't give a fuck. But the police should have removed him. Like, he's her animals. He's tortured his own grandmother. And you're just like, it doesn't, no one's watching him. Thank you, love story. Thank you, Carly. Now... Thank you for the comic cloud. Thank you, Queen Kimmy, as well. Thank you, everyone, for the gifts. So back to this piece of shit. Thank you, guys. So he moved in with Tracy Connolly in February of 2007 and with the family. Hey, Kira. He moved into their first home in Hermitage Road in Tottenham, and it was described by social workers as crump, cramped, unfit for children, untidy and smelling constantly of urine. Yet they were instead of doing anything about it removing the children they just removed the family into church housing association property in nearby penhurst road where they shared with the family rottweiler german shepherd stafford bull terrier snakes and these four children this is the house this church housing thank you guys for the gifts this is the house where peter would die a brutal and agonizing death I will do Evelyn, Evelyn Boswell again at some stage. Social workers who visited the house claimed they were unaware that Peter, that this guy, um, what was it in Stephen Barker, sorry, that Stephen Barker even lived in the home. They said we never saw him, didn't know he was there, and we had no idea that Tracy had any man living with her. Now, he played a crucial role in the four children's lives because, again, Tracy had found a man and she was so lazy that she would lay on the sofa um, 
she would chat to men online, she was always in chat rooms, she was always asleep. So it was his job to prepare the meals, look after the children and bath them. Children that weren't his, three girls, and when we learn about his later crimes, it's disgusting. He actually would do all of these with children that he had only just kind of met. Hey, Minister Smarty. Now, at some time around June of 2007, and we'll go back through the timeline towards the end as well, just to kind of make it all make sense, because I'm not, I'll just do the timeline. His brother, Stephen Bar, his brother, Stephen Barker's brother, sorry, Jason Owen moves into the home. So we're dealing with this guy again. Now, his name was Jason Barker, but he changed it to Owen so people wouldn't recognise him because of what he's done here. He moved into Tracy Connolly's home with his 15 year old girlfriend and his four children. OK, baby P we're talking about today. So at this point, we have a paedophile with his 15 year old girlfriend, his brother who injures animals, Tracy Barker and her four children and his four children all living in a house. Now, Owen, thank you, Jilly, for the comment cloud. Thank you, Ashley. Owen is said to completely dominate his younger brother and the violence against Peter we know escalates during the period this bastard is in the house. This man, sorry. Um, he has he has been an instrumental part of what happened to baby P. So he moves in, the violence escalates and he even said while he was out on bail, yes, they let him out on bail, me and my friend tortured a kid but it went too far. Now, he also tried to flee the country and escape justice before trial, but they managed to get hold of him and find him. So I'm going to take them off now because I really can't be able to look at them anymore. We're going to go back to baby P. So we're going to talk about baby P now and we will talk about that at the end, Dilly. I want to do it in a fact like that makes sense because it's so much easier to do it that way. So we're going to talk about the timeline of Peter's life. So baby P, who we later find out is called Peter Connolly, he is born at the North Middlesex University Hospital on the 1st of March 2006. On the 22nd of March, health visitor Yvonne Douglas makes a first home visit, records that Peter was developing well and breastfeeding, but suffered oral thrush. Because of the family's history, Peter's case was placed in a blue folder, saying there is some cause to, for concern and they want to keep an eye on the family. Um, oral thrush happens all the time in children. That alone is not a cause for concern, but when you have a family who have been neglectful in the past, you would probably want to keep an eye on anything at all that you can. Um, on the 24th of March, the family's GP, Jerome, sees Peter for his oral thrush, and on the 13th of April, the GP carries out Peter's six-week check. On the 2nd of May 2006, Peter is taken to the GP, suffering from diarrhoea and vomiting. And on the 4th of May, Peter's mother takes Peter to the health clinic and is also seen by a health visitor. We know up to this point, um, Peter is given all his vaccinations. He is up to date on everything that he needs to be. He's being taken regularly to his checks at different medical appointments. And this is kind of, Tracy is barely on top of them, but she is on top of them. In May of the first year where he's born, so we're talking about th like three months of age, he is taken to the hospital quite a few times and to doctors because of sickness and diarrhoea. And he he is absolutely um, in pain. He's being sick, he's vomiting, he has diarrhoea and they kind of just seeing him, they're keeping an eye on him. And on the 19th of June, he receives his second lot of vaccinations. Now, it's during the summer of 2006 when Peter's like four or five months of age that Peter's parents separate and his father leaves the family home due to his wife's infidelity. Peter's relationship with Stephen Barker now begins. Now, within three months, he moves in with Peter's mother and her children. And we see what we're seeing here is again, a mother meets a new man doesn't know fuck all about him, has never kind of been around him long enough to know whether he's safe or he's not, moves him straight into the family home. And this period marks the beginning of the end for baby Peter. Um, now, around this time, 
the mother Tracy begins going to a mental health worker and saying she has depression and she's not really doing much around the house and she's kind of being medicated and discussing it and she she seems to be at that time open to kind of doing what she needs to do to kind of get better. Now on the 15th of September the health visitor makes a home visit and, and checks over Peter. On the 18th of September we know that Peter is taken to the GP with a cough and nappy rash and during the consultation the mother Tracy complains that Peter is bruising easily and she worries she might be accused of hurting him. Now we know that Peter is born in the March and by September we are starting to see things are very very sketchy at home. Now I don't think I've ever looked at a bruise on my child and thought oh, are people going to accuse me of doing that to her because I've had no reason to like children bump they bruise especially when they're just starting to toddle and stuff and I've never ever dreamed of going to a health visitor or a doctor and going um if you see bruises she bruises easily it's not me that's done it like I just wouldn't I, it wouldn't occur to me now on the 13th of October Tracy returned to the GP saying Peter has fallen down the stairs and upon examination, the doctor found bruises on his left breast, left cranium and advises the mother to install a stair gate promptly. Now, Peter was only seven and a half months of age at this point and not work it, not walking, unable to walk. He's seven and a half months. So how is he falling downstairs and how is he bumping and bruising that easily? Like he's he's not moving much yet. So. Right, guys, for people coming and asking questions like, are they still in jail? Is this happening? Is that happening? We, we do these cases like a deep dive all the way through. So if it's the first time and you won't understand that yet, but we like the no spoilers in the chat. Thank you for the comic cloud. We just try to go through it so it makes sense and everyone learns like the whole story. So it just makes a lot more sense. Now, on the, yeah, Debbie, if you have to leave, please, please do leave and come back tomorrow and we do a different case because I know it's a hard one. No problem. If you've not been in here before, you don't know. Thank you, Francesca. So on the 17th of November, Tracy again, thanks Kim, takes Peter to the GP for upper respiratory tract infection and thrush. On the 11th of December, she phones the GP and says Peter has a swelling on his head and asks what she should do. Thank you, Millie. The GP asks her to attend surgery for an exam and, cons and then refers Peter to Whittington Hospital for a skeletal scan and blood clotting tests. Now, trigger warning and Shalom we're going to need the trigger warning for a minute because we're going to talk about what the hospital actually viewed that day um, and please understand that the um, these bruises she was still sent home with her child that day and this is why I cover cases like this because there were so many missed opportunities so she's told him he's bumped his head thank you Jacqueline for the comic cloud she said he's bumped his head and they've, she's been asked to bring it down um, he has extensive bruising to Peter's buttocks. His face and his chest were identified to have additional swelling. He also has swelling on his forehead. And his mum says, I have no idea. I probably climbed. Um, and he does slap his body parts sometimes. Um, she says, oh, and by the way, he bruises really easily. Like I have tried to tell medical people that before. She also says that the scratches on his body come from the family dog. Now, she says that you know, I don't really know what's happened. He's just banged his head like I've not seen any of that swelling before. Now, the doctors do tests. They prove, thank you, Jacqueline, that Peter has no underlying conditions that would cause any kind of bruising or swelling. Like he's he's got the all clear from anything that would be medical related. There's also bruising to Peter's forehead, nose, to his right cheek, the breastbone, um, the breastbone, the breast, the right shoulder, both buttocks which the doctor noted down would require significant force in order for them to have that, that shade of bruising. Thank you, Emma. And he has a faint bruise down his left shin. So on the 12th of December, a strategy meeting is held to discuss all of these injuries. It's attended by a social worker in DC, Angela Slade, from the police. A decision was made that Peter could not return to the family home at this point until the police investigation was completed. Now, Tracy at this point offered to take time off work to care for Peter, but they say she can't do this. And she says, look, I have slapped the children in the past and the meeting notes document that Peter's parents were separated and the mother has a friend, no boyfriend living in the home and he will never be left alone with the children. So 
no efforts are made at this point for social services or the police to go and see who this friend is who is spending time with the children they just kind of go it's just her friend that's fine now thank you guys for the gifts on december the 13th a social worker and the police interview two of peter's oldest sub siblings at school and they say oh, we have no concerns about these kids either so on the 14th oh thank you kim yeah on the 14th of december the consultation pediatrician at the whittington hospital heather states the combination of bruising on peter is very suggestive of non-accidental injury and she adds he's not to be allowed home police protection is needed for this child so on the 15th of December, Peter is discharged from the hospital into the care of his mum's 25-year-old friend, Angela Godfrey, who is allegedly a registered childminder, but these checks aren't done. Sylvia Henry, a team manager at the Tottenham Social Service Office, found Peter suitable foster carers and was very reluctant to allow him to go to anyone from the home, none of the family, none of friends. She says, look, he needs to be away. On her um, statement to police, after Peter's death, she writes, My impression of Angela was that she believed the local authority were overreacting and the explanation of Peter's injuries were those of his mother's. They were caused by rough play and head banging. Miss Henry also claims that Miss Godfrey asked for a large sum of money, £320 a week, if she was going to keep Peter for his mum. Now, on 18th of December that year, a social worker, Agnes White, visited Tracy at home and she says on her notes, this home is dirty, untidy, smells of urine and three massive dogs that shouldn't be around children are living here. On the 19th of December, Tracy and the maternal grandmother of baby P are arrested on suspicion of child cruelty. During interviews at Hornsey Police Station in North London, neither give any explanation for any of the injuries. Both say only Tracy and the four children lived at home and that the maternal grandmother sometimes stays. They say there's no man in the house, no one else living there. And Tracy says, I've never slapped him in my life and I never intend to. At the end of the day, I'm a very good mother. I'm not the best mother, but I'm a very good mother. And they're bailed till January the 11th. Now, on the 21st of December, Peter is taken back to the hospital and he has his legs x-rayed. And is she really playing music really loud? Give me a second. Tegan? Give me a second, because the others are in bed. Tegan? Yeah. Turn it down. Sorry. Tori's in bed. Sorry. She's been coming so I'm going to rave upstairs while Tori's in bed. Oh. Sorry, guys. Okay, so his legs are x-rayed on the 21st of December and on the case notes for that x-ray, they say Peter had a good relationship with the biological father, which was seen when he went for his bone scan when only his father could calm his distress. So his, his birth father is there at the time. Now, on the 22nd of December, that same year, so shortly after all this has happened, I know, Leon, a, a child protection conference is held, attended by social workers, legal representation of the local authority and police attend. The family's GP was not invited and the paediatrician at Whittington Hospital did not attend due to work commitments, though she did contribute a detailed written report. Another doctor from the Child Development Centre was invited but also chose not to attend. The conference noted that the paediatrician at the Whittington was of the opinion the injuries were non-accidental in nature and that no adult had given any explanation of how these could have happened. Peter, Peter was registered for both physical abuse and neglect and the youngest of his three sisters was also placed on a child protection register with him. None of the conference members supported the registration of Peter's two eldest sisters and the legal view given orally immediately following the conference and confirmed by email was that the threshold for care proceedings had been met. Now I find this really bizarre. How do you place two siblings in a home on a child protection register but not the older two? Like, I've never seen that done before. Um, how are you just placing two out of the four? Because surely if a home's not safe and the people aren't safe and a child's been severely injured, like, none of the children are safe, does it make sense to anyone else? Like, why that might be? And I know the kids at school have kind of um, said that, they, that they, they aren't being abused, but children lie and they get taught to lie and they get made to say things. And I would just think 
if there is real concerns, they would all be on the on the register on that on the child protection register. <clears throat> so, while staying with Angela Godfrey, the the friend of Tracy, Peter has bruised his testes and claimed they were caused by the hospital staff doing a scan. So on his private areas, he has bruising. His mother had been with him frequently and saw her son three times on the Christmas period. So social workers and health assistants also visit Peter and during this time, the relationship between him and his mother is assessed as positive. On the 9th of January 2007, Angela Godfrey, the woman taking care of him, takes Peter to a health clinic and says he has thrush on his buttocks and he's seen by a health visitor. On January the 10th, the first core group meeting is held and Tracy attends with Peter. On the 12th of January and again on the 27th, Peter's legs are x-rayed again because of some of the injuries he's had before. Now, on the 24th of January, a review strategy meeting was held and it was agreed that if the injuries were non-accidental, it was not clear who the perpetrator was. And the police say that Peter should return home to his mother <sighs> and that she has to make alternative arrangements for the dogs in the house. So <clears throat> they basically say in this report on the 24th of January, we know that the injuries are non-accidental, i.e. someone caused them, but we can't say who did them. So we're just going to send him home. And they sent him home and they sent him to his death. On the 26th of January, Peter returns home despite the dogs being there and no arrangements have been made to get rid of the dogs. And there has been no resolve of the issues that have placed him on child protection. Now, Sylvia Henry... The social worker claims she tried to delay Peter's return, but because the police agreed that he should remain um, in the home, she didn't want to go against them. She told police that reluctantly it was agreed with changes to the home environment in place and the support services in place for the family, there was little grounds for Peter to remain out of the care of his mother. And on the 2nd of February, when he is 11 months of age, Peter has his the first set of vaccination and that same day that he has his vaccinations, he is given a new social worker called Maria Ward. Now, on the 8th of February, 8th of February, a assessment is carried out by Caroline Sussex. And on the 19th of February, the family move into their new four bedroom home, which is the home where Peter would be murdered. On the February the 22nd, social worker Maria Ward made her first home visit and says she observes a good relationship between Peter and his mother. And she says she observes Peter smiling at later visits on the 5th and 8th of March. And we know at this point, Peter is a year old. At some point during March 2007, Tracy was interviewed by a social worker on video for a pilot therapy called Solution Focused Brief Therapy Scheme. During the interview, she talks at length about a male friend about how she's cooked in Valentine's dinner for him. And despite this, Haringey Social Services claim they do not know that Barker exists. But she's been interviewed by them and she's like, my new boyfriend and I love him. He's in the house. I cooked him Valentine's dinner. And they're like, well, we didn't know. But you filmed her saying it like, take note. You had a perfect opportunity to write down everything she's telling you right now because she's like telling you free stuff and you're just ignoring it. <clears throat> No video was ever passed on to the police, not part of the abuse case before Peter's death or evidence of the failed murder trial because Haringey Social Services tried to hide the fact that this video existed and that they did know certain facts. The police maintain that if they had been given the video, they would have wanted to speak to Mr. H, who we know as Mr. Barker. His Tracy would only ever refer to him as Mr. H because she wanted to keep him secret. On March the 2nd, the social worker and health visitor make a home visit and observe Peter headbutting the floor. He is referred to the Child Development Centre and Tracy admits taking her eye off the ball following a breakdown of her marriage, but she says, I'm now back on track and you don't have to worry about the kids anymore. On March the 5th, a school nurse at the Older Children's School phoned, phoned Maria Ward to report that she had observed Tracy shouting in the face of one of Peter's siblings outside the school. The sibling was seen alone and confirmed the assault by her mother and she was then added also to the Child Protection Register. On the 13th of March, Maria Ward interviews Tracy, um, sorry, interviews the paternal father, which we can't name him because of legal thing. So the father says that he wants more contact with his children and he has been advised to get legal advice. He says 
that he knows Tracy has a boyfriend living in the home with his children. And he says he worries about what is happening to his children within the family home, but has no access to go there. And he asks the social worker to look into this. Thank you, Fee, for the me. Now, Tracy then angrily denies this to the social worker and says, nope, he's just a friend. He helped me around the home. He doesn't live here. But despite the fact there is <clears throat> this breakdown in information, no one goes to the house to check the bedrooms, check if there's male stuff there, check if with the kids, like, do you have a man living in the house? They just kind of go, well, she's saying no. You've got her on tape saying it shortly before. Thank you for the gifts, guys. You've got her on tape admitting it. Like, why are we ignoring it? Thank you guys for the gifts. On the 15th of March, Tracy begins a course in mellow parenting. On the 16th of March, a review child protection conference was held in which Tracy is allowed to attend. It was agreed that the social worker would increase announced and unannounced visits to weekly and for there to be further contact with the health visitor, either at home or at the clinic. Now, we know from the court case that the social worker admits to even on unannounced visits to giving Tracy notice. So she would phone up and say, in two days, I'm coming to do an unannounced visit. So Tracy admits that I used to go and stock up the fridge because I knew she was coming. I used to tidy up. I used to do things in place. So you're not doing unannounced visits, which is why they're in place. So you surprise the family. So you get to see what is going on organically and not when I know Fee, it's horrible. Um, but you're you're so scared of Tracy, who's bigger than you and, and it looks a bit wild and she's from a council estate that you decide you're just going to keep warning her. So you warn her and allow her to cover up things happening in the home to the children. It makes no sense. On March the 20th, Peter and his mother are videotaped at a parenting class. And on the 22nd of March, the social worker spots and writes down that Peter has a red mark on his face, which his, mo uh, his mother says, oh, yeah, he's just fallen on the table. On March the 23rd, Peter has his one year checkup at the health clinic. The health visitor, Paulette Thomas, reports no concerns. During the visit, Tracy was reportedly angry and upset with social workers for their high frequency of visits and says that it stops her from relaxing and enjoying her children. We're talking about baby P, Sammy. On March the 29th, another core meeting was held. And this is the most frustrating thing about these cases, this, this case particularly. There was meetings being held constantly and there were people recognising injury and abuse and they still did nothing. Nothing. And no matter how many they had and how much they put them on child protection register, there was no protection in place. And it's so awful. Like, you knew. On the 7th of April, a family friend phoned social services and says she's seen Peter in his garden eating dirt because he's hungry. Mud. And he has large bruises on his forehead. She said she tries to talk to Peter, but he's quiet and withdrawn and she's worried. So she alerts the social worker. On April the 9th, two days later, the GP sees Peter with this bruising on his face. At 4.40, Peter was admitted to the North Middlesex Hospital in Enfield. A nurse noted a large boggy swelling to the left side of his head. And Tracy explains that with it, four days earlier, another child his age had pushed him against a marble fireplace. She said he had seemed grisly but fine over the next two days, but had woken that morning with neck pain and holding his head to the left side. On his medical notes, they note he also has small round bruises on his right cheek, a large swelling and bruising on the left side of his head, bruising around the eyes, scratches to his face and earlobe, a rash on the back of his arms and obvious head lice. Body maps taken at the time indicated bruises and scratches to Peter's face, head and body. Tests for meningitis proved negatively, although Tracy uses this as an excuse that the injuries she has heard about, that means her son definitely has meningitis because there's no other reason for him to have these injuries. A CT scan was normal and social service say that because of all these injuries, they are going to step up and provide the family with a fire guard. You heard me right. So he can no longer hit himself on the fireplace. Um, so with within one month of being on the child protection register, you have been seen with bruises on several different occasions. Once he's fallen on the table, once he's smacked against a fireplace. And so far you've got them a stair gate and a fire guard and sent him back home. 
The four injuries were bruising to the back of Peter's head with boggy swelling that was soft to touch, which caused Peter to be in pain and cry when he moved his neck. Bruising around his eyes, scratches to the left of his face on the left ear lobe, a bruise on his upper lip and two bruises on his back, as well as severe head lice. On admission to hospital, Tracy stated she had a friend in the waiting room who had witnessed the fall and was fearful Peter would be taken into care because he was on the child protection register. The friend is now thought to have been Stephen Barker. Further, a man referred to as his father was present on two evenings but didn't stay while Tracy sat with Peter. A hospital nurse told the social worker the injury was not viewed as non-accidental because it had been caused by another child and police were never informed. And the clothes that baby P was wearing at the hospital were stained with blood, both on the back and on his legs. Um, and yet it was just believed again that um, that it was simply. Um, what, were you, what have I missed? Someone asking. How can you bring this up? Trisha, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we still have children who are being lost to the system and falling through the cracks every single day. And we must continue to talk about cases like Baby P to pick up on the warning signs, the failures. And we mustn't forget Baby P because because he mattered and he wasn't protected here. Um, I cover true crime cases and I talk about things where I think maybe just one person in here may do things differently next time. Um, because of what's happened in this case. So yeah, I cover different cases every single night, no matter what they're about. This is a particularly uncomfortable one, so a lot of people don't cover it, but I think that's the reason why we should talk about it. So on the 10th of April, Peter was referred to the Child Development Centre by a social worker who says that his main issue is that he headbangs. On the 11th, um, against concrete, etc., on April the 11th, Peter was discharged back to the family home and a discharge report dated the 17th of April say that Peter had just suffered a trivial head injury caused by playing with siblings. And that's after all of the injuries I just told you and the fact he needed even a CAT scan and you've wrote it down as a trivial head injury. He had blood all over his clothes. And these are the kind of things that people were doing to fail him. On the 12th of April, a child protection meeting is again held at the North Middlesex Hospital. On April the 24th, the social worker visits the home and saw the children. She discusses the fact that with Tracy that Peter appears unsteady on his feet and unable to stand. On May the 2nd, a core group meeting is held again. On the 3rd of May, Peter and his mum attend another parenting class. On May the 9th, the health visitor made a planned visit to the family home and noted that Peter was lively and active toddler and clean and appropriately dressed. Why do you think that was a planned meeting that you pre-warned them about and he seems to be really clean that day and really like really, really lively? Um, I don't understand why they even do announce visits when you're dealing with a family like this. On May the 10th, the parenting class was missed. On May the 16th, May Marie Lockhart, a family support service worker, visits the home and observes Peter and a sibling playing happy together. Barker is now known to have answered the door to her at this home. And again, it's not noticed that there's a male in the home that shouldn't be. On the 18th of May, Peter was seen by the GP for an allergic reaction and he is given antihistamines. On the 27th of May, on the 21st of May, sorry, social worker visited and saw the children playing happily and observed that at this point they are well. Thank you, Amy. On the 24th, again, a parent in class is missed. And on the 31st, again, a parenting class is missed. Now, these are parenting classes put in place by a child protection plans to say you must do parenting classes. You've missed four in a row at this point and nothing is done. Nothing. You're not following up on why they're being missed. She hasn't got a job. Peter's at home all the time. There's no real reason he can be poorly for one week. She's not phoning in. She's just not turning up. So that, again, is another red flag. We've asked you to do something very simple to prove that you're a parent and you can stick to a plan and you're not. Um, on the June 1st, the social worker made an unannounced visit to the family home and found Peter lying on the sofa under a blanket with a red face. He has bruising under his chin and red lines underneath his eyes. Tracy claimed it was caused by a squabble with a French child and the social worker says that Tracy has to take Peter to the GP and he was taken to the GP. At that GP appointment, Peter is found to have 
12 areas of bruising and scratching on different parts of his body and a grab mark on his lower right leg that doctors were particularly concerned about. Out of the 12 bruises, they're all of different ages caused at different times and not during one time. Tracy's account for the bruises was that her friend had been staying between the 25th and 28th of May and she thought the bruises were caused by rough play with a friend, 22-month-old child. She said the grab mark was caused by her trying to save Peter as he fell off the sofa. The social worker informs police, but they say they do not want to undertake a, a joint investigation, but say we allow you to look into it, social, um, social services and call us if you feel like we have a role. The social worker was happy for Peter to be discharged back to his mother um, as she was excited, the mother, that a family friend was coming to stay with them. Now, what Tracy has learned, and you can see this quite quickly, she has learned that when she said another child caused the injuries to Peter, they went, oh, that's OK, that's just rough play. So now the next three times he's presented with awful injuries, she's blamed it on another child and they've gone, oh, OK. Now, on that time that social services happily allowed Tracy to take him home from the GP, the full injuries written down on the social services list were 12 marks of, bruise, 12 marks of bruises, scratches and marks on the right lower jaw, to the left earlobe, under the left eye, on his left nostril and left corner of his mouth. He has bruises to his right chest, lower back, just below the umbilical cord um, where it would go. The type of um, the tip of the left middle finger and the left lower leg are all bruised um, and she's just like yeah gee take him home on the 3rd of June the health visitor contacted the hospital who told her Peter also has an infected finger now and they say okay well we've seen Tracy and she's bonding really well with him on the 4th of June a strategy meeting was held and requested the police who were convinced the injuries were non-accidental so they've asked for this strategy to meet him agreement was reached to undertake a section 47 inquiry to hold an urgent legal planning meeting to consider the care proceedings fast track a paediatric assessment make arrangements for peter to be supervised by the in the family home by angela godfrey agree a contract with tracy find a child minder to assist with child care during the day and a joint investigation by the police and social services will be ongoing on june the 5th tracy's arrested for a second time and cautioned under interviewed under caution by the police at hornsey police station and she offers a variety of possible causes for injuries. She says, I've never hit him, so whatever. Which, why do I keep getting upset? Which is why I keep getting upset, because I'm being accused of something I haven't even done. Why do you keep going on about it? The interview detective, Constable Stuart O'Brien, said there are various different bruises, various different injuries. There's a lot of injuries every week. Either he's the unluckiest kid in the world or something is more to this. The mother replied, it's not something more, I swear. My world will fall apart without him. I've been trying for a boy for so long, I'm lucky to have him. On 5th of June, Tracy and Angela Godfrey meet the team manager to sign a written agreement to the effect that Tracy and Peter would not be left alone together. A registered childminder, Anne Walker, would care for Peter and his youngest sibling for certain days during the week, and the agreement would be re reviewed in a fortnight to see how it's getting on. Now, if you have been arrested twice for injuring your child and you are told you cannot be alone with your child, why is he still in the family home? Why is he allowed there at all? If, he, if his mother is that dangerous to him that she cannot be alone with her child, we're in 2007 now, Nanny Barbs, he was born in 2006. Like, why is he still there? I don't understand it. A senior officer wrote in his log at the police station, this situation cannot continue. I am at a loss as to why our position is variance to that by social services. Our concerns for baby Pete are valid. Why is he in the home? On the 6th of June, Peter is seen at the health clinic by Paulette Thomas again, the health visitor. She notes he has lost weight since March and has scabs all over his head. Tracy says this is just an allergic reaction. On the 8th of June, a review child protection conference is held. The social worker informs the conference of the 1st of June injuries and that Tracy's accounts do not explain them. The reasonable conclusion from the medical exam was the injuries were non-accidental and the meeting was informed that a legal planning meeting was to be held within the next week to make future decision making. The conference chair expressed her concern that Peter was experiencing the same injuries for which he was originally placed on the child protection plan. In addition, if they were caused by Peter's own behaviour, as his mother claimed, then he should be continuing um, all the time 
not just when he's in his mum's care. On June the 8th, the police took pictures of Peter and seized a toy from the home and a photo of Peter shows a bruise at the centre of his spine. On June the 12th, the childminder Anne Walker phones the social services and says she's concerned about baby P. He has head injuries, which is weeping blood, and he is unwashed. He smells of vomit and he's always starving. Hey, Sonia. On the 15th of June, the family support service worker visits the family home. And again, Stephen Barker is present. Tracy was upset at being arrested for injuries to Peter. She said she was happy to speak in front of Barker because he knew everything. Also that day, the child mind to tell social services that once again, Peter has another bruise on his chin. But she says, I don't know where it's come from. It's not been in my care. And the support worker says, I think it's just an old injury. Don't worry about it. On the 19th of June, Peter and the youngest of his siblings were visited by a social worker at the, the childminder's house. Both children interacted well with three other children being looked after and the childminder says, I don't have any new concerns, like she's been phoning them. Although no mention is made of the executive summary of the serious case review, Anne Walker claims she repeatedly raised concerns about Peter. She was quoted in the press as saying, he was dying. I told them he was dying. I told them about the state. I said things were not right, but nothing is done. If someone was had taken action, we would not be mourning the loss of a baby's life. The, morning, the warning signs were there. It was upsetting. Four or five times I phoned about bruises, marks, nappy rash, dried blood in his ears. He always smelled of vomit. His clothes were dirty. His fingers were black. His nails were broken. Once he pulled off his fingernails, he had a large scab on his head that would weep blood. He was in a terrible state. No one wanted to help him. Um, we'll talk about stuff as we go on. Anne further says she was told she had been employed to give the mum a break and to report any injuries she found to social workers who she was told would visit, but only did so once. She said that when she reported the injuries and asked how they'd happened, she was just told by the mum he's just accident prone. On the June the 20th, a core group meeting is held and on the June the 21st, Peter and his mum go to another parenting class. On June the 29th, the social worker has a message from Anne Walker, the childminder, that Tracy had taken Peter away. The social worker tries to contact Tracy three times that day without any success. Maria Ward states that she was going, um, that she has spoken to Tracy and she's going away for her birthday. Now, around the June 29th, it's the first time we know for sure that Jason Owen is living in the home. That's Stephen Barker's brother. And he has brought his children and his 15 year old girlfriend to live with him, to live with them all. So <laughs> he was on the run because he was a paedophile and had his girlfriend with him and needed somewhere to hide. And Tracy took him in, 15. Um, at this point, social services don't notice that Tracy is concealing six extra people in her home in a four bedroom home that already has five residents, they now have a further six and no one seems to notice. Hangay Council say they are unaware of this despite the numerous visits by various professionals to Peter's home in the last few weeks of his short life. On the 2nd of July, the social worker managed to speak to Tracy who said she was caring for a seriously ill uncle in Cricklewood and would return on the 4th to the 9th of July depending on his health. This was found to be a complete fabrication and it is believed that she was hiding Peter because he had visible injuries at the time. School electronic attendance records show that the two eldest children did not attend school between the 29th of June and the 5th of July. On the 5th of July, Peter um, attends a parenting class with his mother and on the 9th of July, the social worker made contact with Tracy, who was back in Harangay. Tracy had taken Peter to walk-in clinic at the North Middlesex Hospital for an ear and scalp infection. Later that day, the social worker visited the family home and saw all the children. She notes Peter's ear was red and looked sore and Tracy shows the social worker the medicine that has been prescribed. On the 10th of July, the police meeting leads experts to agree that the injuries to Peter in December 2006 are suggestive of non-accidental injury, but are non-conclusive. 
On July the 11th, the social worker made a home visit and she says again, Peter's ear and scalp look sore. On the 16th of July, Tracy cancels the appointment with the health visitor to look at Peter's scalp and his ear. On the 18th of July, she takes Peter to the health clinic for an ear and scalp infection. Peter's weight has reduced right down to the 25th percentile. And he has lost masses of weight. I'm going to put a picture of it. it it's sad to see the difference in Peter, but it's really important that we um, we do look. Um, and we know, particularly in this picture and in later stages, that Tracy covers his bruises in chocolate and that's why he's often viewed with chocolate, etc. Now, just months before this picture, this is what Peter looked like. So the difference in weight is is he is a bouncy, bubbly, little chubby baby. And all of a sudden, this is how Peter looks. And social services aren't picking up on any of these things in a child who has reduced in weight. He looks nervous. He looks anxious. He looks scared. It, it, he, you, I'm not a social worker and I can see a clear difference. Tracy said that Peter has been seen on the 16th of July and treated with cream for head scabs. It was noted that Peter was on the child protection plan and was well and was well groomed and nourished, and there was no ex unexplainable injuries at this time. And he's given antibiotics for his head and his ear. On nineteenth of July, Tracy takes Peter back to the walking clinic at the North Windlesex Hospital, where he's referred to A and E. A history was taken. He was assessed and described as alert and looking good. So he's. Described as looking good, but his notes say he has an infected scalp with bloody scabs, head lice and blood around his left ear where he's been scratching. He looks grubby and the middle finger of his right hand was infected in the nail bed. He has got some kind of reaction, which Tracy says is a hives reaction to Leicester cheese, which has become infected from scratching and doctors do not investigate this. On July the 23rd, Anne Walker, the child minder, phoned social worker to say she can no longer care for Peter and his and his sister. She says, I have other children here. They have severe head lice. You're not doing anything about it. And the social worker then phones Tracy and says, look, what's going on with this infection? Why isn't it clearing up? Why aren't you getting more help for him? And on the same day, an appointment for Peter at the Child Development Centre at St Anne's Hospital is cancelled and Tracy fails to attend the appointment with the health visitor and just says, oh, I forgot. On July the 25th, the legal planning meeting that we've been waiting for for since December of the year before takes place and they decide that Peter has not had enough injuries to meet the threshold to go into care. On the 26th of July, the social worker phones Tracy for details of Peter's visit to the GP, where she has taken him for head lice and blood in his ear. And according to Tracy, the GP didn't describe further antibiotics and was not concerned. The GP later said during the trial, I did see there was reason for concern, but I did nothing because I thought someone else would do something. And I'm just like... He said, I knew the Child Development Centre would see him in a few days, so I just take it that they will do something. He said it was also very hard to do an examination on baby P because he pulled away during an examination and flinched, which should be a massive red flag um, that he's flinched away from you. So you go, oh, someone else will do something here. This is too hard. On the 27th of July, Peter spent a night at his father's home and reportedly healthy apart from a scab infection and a bandage on his finger. On the 30th of July, the social worker made a planned visit to the family home and all of the children were seen both on their own and with their mother. Peter was in the buggy and reported to be alert and smiling but overtired. His, all, his ear was sore and slightly infamed. He had white cream all over his head and Tracy said she thought the infection had improved. Peter's face was smeared with chocolate and the social worker asked for that to be cleaned off. Stephen Barker took him upstairs to clean off the chocolate but did not come back with baby P. And so the social worker left. So, she asks him to wipe the chocolate off his face so she can have a look if he has any injuries. And a man takes him upstairs, doesn't return. So she goes, well, I'm just gonna leave. Um, 
and she and before she leaves tracy says to her look i do have a a visit to the gp planned already because peter does have some grab marks on him and i'm worrying that you're going to blame me and she just leaves on the 31st of July, the police meet the, the, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, who say they want to NFA Peter's case, no further action. They say there's insufficient evidence against Tracy and her mother to carry on an investigation. At this point, he's a year and four months old. On the 1st of August... Tracy and Angela Godfrey take Peter to the Child Development Centre appointment at St Anne's Hospital and he's seen by a locum paediatric. This was after two previous appointments had already been cancelled and the doctor said she thought Angela Godfrey was Peter's foster carer. Peter's referral to the clinic made it clear he was on the child protection register but not, did not state that the focus of the current inquiry were injuries to him. Now on that day Peter was unwell with a temperature, a runny nose and had visible bruises on him. Tracy shared her concerns about Peter's behaviour and got tearful when she said CPS had tried to accuse her of causing bruising to Peter and he was a very much wanted boy. Peter's weight over the last two months have gone from being on the 25th percentile to this appointment where he's on the 9th percentile. And I don't know if you will understand what that means, um, but when you have a baby they take the baby's weight and they place it on a percentile from zero to 100. And zero is like, so 50, the 50th line is what most babies that age weigh. And then your baby normally carries on a projectile. So if your baby's born at 75, they normally carry on like they're a bit heavier, but they carry on that scale. So Peter had been born around 50th, had gone down to the 25th, and now he was on the 9th within two months. The, pedi uh, the paediatrician concludes that Peter was unwell due to a possible viral infection. Her report also states he had a history of recurrent bruising and infections, abnormal behaviours, saying that Peter, apparently, according to his mum, was aggressive, headbutt things, head banging, and hyperactivity. And there was a possibility he might have some high underlying uh, metabolic disorder due to his weight loss. She says that she did not perform an examination on Peter at this appointment because he was miserable and cranky. No reports have been provided to his previous admissions at the other hospitals, so she didn't look if he had any injuries. Um, so that's what I mean, MJL. So if, you're, if your child was born on the 5th, they, she would just like carry on around that way, do you know what I mean, like on that line. And if she dropped or she went higher, they would say, look, something may be going on, and that's how they kind of view things. Um, so, it, you know, your baby could be born on the second percent aisle. And as long as it like it continues on and it, it looks normal, they wouldn't cause any kind of, like norm, like apart from, you know, if they need to gain weight or everything. But in here, where there's these massive drops and you go, maybe it's um, metabolic. And I don't care if you knew you were looking for injuries, you know that he was on a child protection plan. So there was reason to do a full examination. And you've gone, he was too cranky. We've waited for this appointment for ages. It was supposed to be... Yeah, the Red Book. Yeah, we have a Red Book in England. Right. Now, trigger warning, guys. According to the post-mortem that would be later done on baby P, at this visit to the clinic with the paediatrician, Peter would have already been suffering from numerous fractured ribs and a broken spine. The broken spine would have left him paralysed and unable to empty his bladder. Despite this, a paediatrician left him in his buggy because he was tired and cranky and didn't check for injury. She noted in her paperwork, he didn't look any different from any other child his age with a common cold. She says, I'm sure he was moving his legs and sitting without support and there was no reason for me to suspect anything else. At this point, Peter could and should have been saved. You are a paediatrician. You've been asked by social services and the police to do a proper investigation on a child who is on a child protection register. And you left him in his buggy because you said, well, he's a bit cranky. Why was he cranky? He had a broken spine. 
that injury in a full-blown adult would leave you paralysed. No wonder he was crunky. And the reason his eyes are streaming, his nose is streaming, is because he's dying. He is dying in front of your eyes and you did nothing. The same day, Tracy cancels other health appointment visits for Peter. On the 2nd of August, Tracy was last seen by police at the social service office and was told that neither prosecutions against her would be pursued. She cries with relief and says she will go back and give Peter a hug and bake him a cake. She also decides to cancel GP appointments. At 1.01, uh, sorry, 1.10, on Friday the 3rd of August, Tracy chats to a friend over the phone and says the children are all fine. At 11.35 on the 3rd of August, London Ambulance Service responds to a 999 call. The caller was Tracy, who reports that her 17-month-old child, who has been taking antibiotics, was now not moving. She reports to the crew who arrive at 11.43 that she last seen him at approximately 1am and he had been unwell recently with a fungal infection. Tracy travelled in the ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital with Peter arriving at 11.49am and he would be pronounced dead at 12.19. The police were called and Tracy was arrested at 1.45. Ambulance crews state that it was clear that Peter had been dead for some time before they were called and that Tracy seemed more concerned with her hair and getting her cigarettes than bothered with her dead baby. They also noted the disgusting state of the house, which contained dismembered animals and human feces smeared up the walls. By the time the ambulance arrived, Barker, Owen and his 15-year-old girlfriend had already left to dispose of Peter's bloody sheets and other evidence and to go on the run. They were eventually found by police in a campsite near Epping Forest with a stash of weapons. All items of clothing owned by Peter were found um, by the police to be bloodstained. Every item of clothing that baby P owned in that house was bloodstained. Everything. I'm going to go through the autopsy report, which is obviously really important in this case. Baby P had severe cuts to the top of his head, including wounds where a dog had bitten his scalp. Three large bru bruises on his forehead, bruising on his right cheek, a broken back and bleeding around the spine and at the base of the neck. Blackened fingers and toenails, one finger missing nail and a tip had been stripped of all the skin. Eight broken ribs between one and two weeks of age and remember how many medical appointments he'd had in that time. Three faint bruises on his chest, old fractures to his shin bone, skin missing from his nose, bruising on the left temple and above his left ear. His left ear was ripped so it was coming away from his head. Cuts on the front of his neck and beneath his chin. Skin missing from his lips and tongue from a blow. Skin between his upper lip and gum torn, front tooth knocked out. Faint bruises on his lower back and upper back. Three faint bruises on his left shin and a small bruise on his toe. Now, Peter's murderers, his mother, Tracy Connolly, her boyfriend, Stephen Barker, and his brother, Jason Owen, none of them were charged with murder or manslaughter. Because they blamed each other, they were only ever convicted of causing or allowing the death of a child. So no one has ever paid for his death. And I get really sad because I just think after everything, Stephen Barker was sentenced to 12 years. Tracy Connolly was sentenced to life with a minimum of five years. And Jason Owen 
was sentenced to six years and got out in three. Stephen Barker, the mother's boyfriend, was convicted of, was given an extra 10 years because he raped a two-year-old baby girl. So, Stephen Barker was sentenced to a minimum of 22 years, 12 for what happened to Baby Pete, and 10 for what happened to the two-year-old girl. He's been up for parole several times. He is still in prison at the moment. Jason Owens, he served three years for what happened to Baby P. They ignored the fact completely that he was actually raping a 15-year-old girl at the time. This happened in the family home. Um and is a known offender of children. So he was out within three years. Tracy Connolly got life on a minimum of five years. This is her now. So far, she's been released several times and been put back in prison. She was released in 2013 after being convicted in 2009. So for the first time, she, she served four years for what happened to Baby P. She was released in 2013, recalled to prison in 2015, released again in 2022, and she's just been recalled again to prison. Um, and she has been recalled to prison for visiting people or places that she was banned from doing. Um, what what does what does these sentences teach anyone about what's happening to children? Like Peter's short life was full of pain and suffering. For what? And in my opinion, every medical person, every social service, every police who were aware of what's going on, they helped to murder this little boy. Because there are so many chances they had where they could have could have saved baby Peter. He was in front of two medical doctors, a paediatrician, a, a child doctor and a GP with a broken back and a broken spine and nobody noticed. And both of them said, well, I thought someone else would do something. <sighs> Things now are exactly the same. The statistics for child death because of abuse is in between one to four children we're losing in the UK every single week. Most of these are on the child protection register when they die. Um, and again and again, we're seeing the same things happen and these children are dying in, in vain. I found this article in live, which I really wanted to talk about because I thought it was really, really important. Um, because if you remember when all of this happened, um, everyone kept saying, the police, Harringay Council, all these people kept saying, like, we are learning from this. Like, there will never be another baby pee. But yet, four more boys, four more baby peas died under the same council within that year. Um Four children from the same city suffered horrific deaths within a year of each other after a series of failings with baby peer by social services. Months before the boys died, officials responded to child safety concerns, said they were going to improve 74 areas to prevent a tragedy like baby P ever happening again within a year. Yet they failed to save seven-year-old Blake Fowler. Thank you, Ash despite 18 reports to social services that he had been violently hurt in the family home. 18 reports, and yet he died. Details of his death in 2011 emerged in a serious case review report. Brothers Jaden and Bradley Adams, two and four, and three-month-old Nico Maynard were also failed by Southampton City Council um, so not the same council, but they died also in the same year. And this is a time in the next two years after baby P, eight more children slipped through the net, including a six-year-old girl who was admitted to hospital with 92 injuries and drugs in her system and given back to her family.
And this is like, it just doesn't, I don't know um, what else to say. Um, we, it doesn't say her name here. It just says including a six-year-old girl. I'm just reading from an article, but they come out, I'll have a look in a minute if we can find. This is, um, I didn't even realise till I researched this case in the last couple of days to do it, how low their sentences have been. But I didn't understand. I, I take it they were their birth father. I'll have a look in a second. But how did, how did, because none of them would admit to it, that they just went, oh, we won't do anyone for murder then. I don't understand how that's happened in this case. I am friends with Peter's dad. Is he, um, does he have the other children read? That's all we want to know. Are they safe? Are they okay? Um, obviously, I don't expect any more information that they, they have their right to privacy and a good life. And I hope they're having a good life. Um, they're safe. Good. Thank you, Red. Um, this case is horrendous. And I just wanted to go through the whole timeline with you guys because I wanted you to realise how many chances there were to be to be some kind of resolution here for the children to be saved. Um, the fact that they that his mum has got out several times um, just makes me sick. It was her job. It was her job to protect him. She lied to cover this up so many times. At any of these appointments, if she had been scared, she could have said, I need help. Like, he's being hurt. Any of this, she, you lied and you lied and you lied to cover it up. I'm going to go through with some pictures on the big screen and I get, I'm going to, if we can just flood the chat with blue hearts for baby P, Peter Connolly, man, because we have to... We have a look... Remember that face, because this is what she looks like now. These are the clothes he was wearing. these are some of the other children who died in the year after baby P. Two brothers who died within three months of each other, despite the fact their mum said, please take them into care, they're not okay here. And these are just the, the full timeline for anyone who missed when we first started talking about Peter being born, um, the time that she meets the new partner, um, all of these different injuries the list goes on in his files of all the times he was taken to the hospital they had injuries that people saw things that weren't right um, yeah he was he was seen on August the 1st by a paediatrician who said he's just cranky and by, by August the 3rd he's dead and we know afterwards that he already had I'll just go through that little bit there that we haven't really talked about. Um, Ed Balls, the school secretary, orders a report by into the failure by authority to save Peter's, li see, save Peter's life. November the 21st, the General Medical Council suspends the doctor who saw him on that last day. Harringay Council's leader and cabinet member for children resigns as a damning report is publicised, where Sharon Shoesmith, its director of children's services, is suspended and later sacked. Three social service managers and Miss Ward are sacked from Harringay Council. May the 1st, Barker is convicted of raping a two-year-old girl. May the 13th, NHS bodies are criticised by the new health watchdog, the Care Quality Commission, for systematic failures in the care given to Peter before his death. Baby P's mother is jailed indefinitely for a minimum period of five years. And Peter's mother and her boyfriend are named after a court order protecting their anonymity expires. Um, thank you, Miss Sorority. I just um, I just wanted people to realise, because we've been talking about the Sarah Sharif case, and I wanted people to really realise that we were going through the same thing with Baby P. Um, 
but there was more service of it, like like people involved. She was on parenting courses. There was GPs. There was there was health workers all the time involved, and they said they were going to learn. They said they were going to make sure there was ninety four things they accepted they had done wrong in the case of baby P, and they were going to make things different for further children. Um, and it it hasn't come yet, and there has to be a way where we start actually learning, and these social services start working with baby P in mind all the time, all the time to make sure it never happens again. Because I personally would rather you were removing children left, right and centre and placing them in emergency care while you check these things out. I honestly would rather they were doing that than keeping kids in homes where they're being killed because this can't keep happening. Do you know, I've never ever, I've, I've got three children and my oldest is 17. I have never had a child go to the GP with multiple injuries. Kids have falls, yeah? My youngest broke her elbow falling down the stairs. Um, she had one injury. Like, she didn't have scratches, cuts, bruises. Like, there is no time when a child, even in a fall, should have multiple injuries that aren't being looked into. To me, it doesn't seem okay. I think my comments have stopped again. Hang on. My comments have stopped again. Hang on. My comments have stopped again. Hang on. Of alive and have been like, why do they keep pausing? Um, yeah, so it's I am. Um, I don't have much to say about that case. I don't understand how there was any justice at all from anyone. Let you sack a couple of people from their jobs or just go on to get new ones. Um, there should be like criminal prosecution. Um, for for you're you're trained as a doctor to 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 do things, and to, to be a pediatrician uh, pediatrician to protect children, and you failed. You failed. You failed in your job and your position. And if you didn't feel like you could examine him because he was groggy, get someone else in who can. But your job was to examine him and he shouldn't have left that hospital until he was examined because he would still be here now. And you can't, you can't actually change that. Like he should have be still here. Um, please look into me. What Katie, sorry, I didn't see your first comment. Um, pictures of the house released. I'll have a look. I can't really see any inside the house. Can you hear me? No. You're not talking, I am. She's got £600,000 after being sacked. Yeah, I'll have a look when I come off Queen Gimme. Um, oh, hang on, there is here. Let's go there. Peter Stab was never considered by social services and never assessed for custody. I don't understand that. Why were they giving it to the Angela woman um, rather than to to his father? I don't understand that. I've never seen that in another case where you just give it to. I can't really see many. People keep saying that's a stock photo of their house, but I can't see any inside. Mm. Look at him when he's born. Thank you, Haley, for coming. It, it, it is really. I, I, I hate doing these cases because I feel um, really sad about doing them. But at the same time, I think it's really important to cover these cases. Um, I it feels horrible, like when people were having. Uh, we talk about Sarah Street Valley, and they were like, you know, hopefully they'll make a difference in her in her memory. And I'm just like, they haven't already. I love this picture. Look how beautiful boy he is, man. She 
Shanae Walker. His reports of abuse the kids were taken as malicious. How are they taken as malicious when you already know they're being abused? I just don't understand. I don't understand how these people like like even like even not in your job role, but as just a human being, how you can see a child who is so obviously changing before your eyes, like changing severe looks like he's been in some kind of concentration camp. Like it's literally so poorly and you just don't do anything. You just don't do anything. And you, oh, he just looked like, thanks, Kate. He, he just looked like he had a normal cold. Like, how? How? He should have just been out of college now. Have covered Jamie Bolger a few times before. It's such an awful case as well. Um, the thing is, you, you research these cases and you just come out of case after case after case. And you just wonder, like, why do we have a social service if they're not... Um, if, if they're not, if they're not working to save children, I have done Arthur's case, case as well. I remember when Arthur was found murdered and on the, the newspaper I had a picture of Arthur and then a picture of Baby P and it was like the headlines that like, have we learned nothing from Baby P? And again, social services involved. You'll find in all of these cases, 99.9% um, .9 of these cases, they were on child protection. They were known by social services. There were issues. There were concerns. Like we don't often... Poppy, I haven't done Poppy Worthington's case yet. Um, I try to do these cases um, as spread out as I can because I know how much they affect people. But it's really important that we talk about the cases. Um, I just... Alfie still... I haven't covered Alfie yet either. Um... Um, so many are not covered by the media so many are not um, a lot of these things are hidden because people don't want to take any any blame or fault in anything so they just they just act like it never happened sometimes if you don't have families pushing them like you know baby P's father for instance like pushing the case out they, they, they would just rather people didn't know because it's uncomfortable right it's really I, I have done startups once before it must be over a year ago now Michelle um it's really uncomfortable for people to read these cases. And I have people that um, message me and say like, oh, can you not do child cases anymore? And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, you find it really uncomfortable, but it's really important. It's vital that we talk about them. Um, it might inspire someone in here who will go on to be a social worker, a fucking good one, and think like, I will never let that happen. It might also make a neighbor look at a child and think, I need to phone social services and maybe next time they'll do something. Um, Ricky Neve, yeah, I have covered Ricky Neve before. Um, there, there may be somebody who is saved because of these lives. And I always say like, as uncomfortable it is for us to hear them, especially if you have children, of course it's uncomfortable, we hate it. But at the same time, like he went through it, like he lived it. Um, he really lived it. And like the one thing that made me cry the most in this was not only that they missed, his broken back or they smeared him in chocolate is the fact the fucking justice you gave in that courtroom like you read what we read but you saw the pictures you saw the pictures of him deceased you saw the injuries like how are you okay with giving like the maximum of 12 years for what they did to him like that's a very sad case as well Adele. really sad like how how is that justice how are they walking on these streets like how are they ever allowed out like why would they ever be allowed to walk on the same streets going in the parks that our children go in like why are they given that opportunity like they've shown who they are you know the one still in prison enjoyed hurting animals tortured his own granny raped a baby like why is he even allowed to go up for parole he's been up for parole three four times now like what what why are we paroling a fucking monster like at least let baby P's memory and legacy be that this man will never hurt another fucking child. At least give him that. Like, Barker is, is above and beyond a danger to every single person who walks among us. This man is sick. Like, the things I can list that he's done 
and the graphic information available on this guy and why are we even considering him for parole? Why is it an option? Why has Tracy been released three times and fucked up again? Because by the third time, surely, like in America, you're fucked for life. Thank you for the, uh, the love heart. Um, we're releasing her and giving her chances. Jason Owen was a paedophile who lived in the home with his 15-year-old girlfriend, had tortured his grandma, and then took him part in the, in the death of baby P. He was out in three years. Three years. What is he doing out there now? Should we, I would make bigger prisons for people like that, Kazi. They should be put down. They should have exactly the same done done to 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 them that happened to Baby P on a bigger scale. Like, why would we ever allow that? Jason Owen could be living with a single mother right now with children, access to children, because no one's tra tracking him. He's out. He served his time, so no one cares. They didn't even do him for having a 15-year-old girlfriend. So he's not on an offender's register. No one's watching where he is. That's what makes me so angry. I'm so sorry, Ash. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, he's done it again, has he? Let me have a look. I didn't even look at him. Um, I looked at him briefly earlier. He's returned to prison. Oh, so he was returned to prison. A man jailed over the death of baby P has been returned to prison for breaching conditions. He was released on pro in August after um, 2011. Um, I don't know where he is now. I think he was. He's been freed again. I believe. Let's look. So he's, he was released again in 2015, got a whole new identity that no one's allowed to know. And he now works as a life coach and fitness advice person, having access to women and men. And they, they're not allowed to know who he is. He is no longer under no a license, so authorities cannot monitor him anymore. So... This was the last picture we have of him, if anyone recognises him or has seen him somewhere. Like, do you know what people, a life coach, help vulnerable people who need help and guidance in their life? And you're allowing him to have access to women who need fitness help. And who needs fitness help? People who have low self-esteem because of their weight, because of their strength, whatever. So you're actually planting him in places where he will have access to people. And we keep doing this. Maxine Carr works for the, the charity Mind. I'll, I'll just say it, I don't care if I get in trouble. She works for Mind, helping people, um, men mainly with mental health issues. Um, and this is what we're doing. The attacks on Peter, known as known as at the time as Baby P, took place while Owen, who was already a convicted arsonist and crack addict, was lodging there. So, yeah, Huntley's bad. Um, there's we don't we don't have any protection, okay? Because as normal everyday people who haven't committed awful crimes, we don't have any we don't have any like human rights to be protected we also don't have any protected like rights for our children really to be protected from the offenders but they have rights they're not on license anymore they can walk freely among us they can work wherever they want they can have access to vulnerable people we know james bolger james bolger's killer was let out of prison and was given a new identity moved in with a single mother and her children and it was only when he was there he was rearrested for having images of children and a manual on how to rape babies that he was rearrested and the single mother was told oh by the way that's john venables and she wasn't and they, she said like well, how how was he allowed to live with me and my children and they said well because he's got a new identity like he's been released he served his time so she didn't have the right to know but he had the right to live with her and her children. He killed a child. 
Um, and that's how our society is working, where we don't have the right to be protected. We don't have the right to know anyone's criminal background if they have a new identity because they don't want the new identity to get out. Um, so, so where's the right for the children that live in that home? Because you'd think instantly, even if you didn't want to tell her who it was, you would you would have access to Venables and say, look, you need to go. You need to go out of this house right now or you'll be rearrested. Is Sam Walker is wanted by police for exposing yeah, uh, John, Bonab John Venables' face. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to change the law. Sorry, guys, I'm just vaping for a second. Now, why aren't we allowed his new name? Why should he be allowed a name change? It's all okay. So Tracy Con this was written in September this year. Tracy Connolly, 42, was given an indefinite sentence with a minimum of five years. Um, she was released from prison in 2013. She was later recalled to prison after selling nude photos online. She used £14,000 of public money in a bid to recover custody of her three daughters were in prison. So we paid for her to try and do that. Um, after what she did to Baby P, we gave her £14,000 to fight for the other children. Hey, Kate. On the 5th of May 2022, she was then released from jail again. Despite the government of the jail also, and the government both saying she shouldn't be released, we released her again. Um, at this time, Justice Secretary Dominic, Ra uh, Dominic Rabb um, branded her actions of pure evil and said that we needed an overhaul. She's now on her way back to jail just over two years after last being released. Um, this is her in 2022. Ghastly. Um, enjoying birthday breakfasts and stuff. Like Peter never even got to celebrate his second birthday, but she'll put this all over social media showing off. Um, Absolute C U N T. Do you know what I mean? How do you even enjoy another birthday again after what you've done? She was subjected to 20 license conditions, including having to wear an electronic tag, disclose all her relationships, and having her internet use monitored and obeying a curfew. She was also banned from going to certain places to avoid contact with victims and to protect children, and that's what she breached. Let's have a look at Stephen Barker, he's still in prison. A fresh parole hearing could happen within months. It would be Barker's fifth parole bid during his prison sentence. His last request for parole was denied after psychiatrists determined the criminal would not partake in mental health treatment programmes. One source told the Mirror Barker is hell-bent on being released. He has a string of hearings so far and he will argue he has not caused problems in prison. But the thought of him being released is sickening. Barker's older sibling Jason Owen had set up a base in Connolly's home. At the time of the tot's death, he had a 15-year-old a relationship with a teenage girl despite the fact he was in his late 30s um however he was jailed again for violating his parole in 2013 in 2015 the male previously found the baby killer transformed into an online personal trainer with no mention of his past on his youtube videos he no longer is on license and cannot be monitored by authorities so apparently he's on he's on social media somewhere um i wonder if he's on tiktok they all seem to be. If anyone comes across them on social media anywhere, please let me know straight away and I'll allow it. Um, there's no licensing condition. There's nothing saying I can't because um, this, should, this should not be happening. He does lives now on YouTube and people watch them. Um... I've got to find it again. You'd think so, wouldn't you? You'd think someone would get hold of him. Where did I see that picture of him before? It's not on this one. Oh yeah, I've got it. Um, how are people watching him on YouTube? Someone get me his name if they're not on YouTube. Well, look.
Do you know his name, Kyla? Hmm. <laughs> There's some things you cannot be, um, Wolverine. Uh, there's some things you cannot be healed from or changed from. There's also some things you can never be forgiven for. Thank you for helping me. And that is any hurt or murder or sexual assault of children. Like there's no fix for that. And even if there was a fix for that, you should still need be never forgiven for that crime. Like there is, there is no way in the world in which you could be like, oh, okay, he's changed his ways. Like, you know, I don't understand any of that. Um, you, you just never um, I do as well Old Wavy I really struggle with um, thinking of kind of what Baby P went through in the last months of his life and also Sarah Sharif like how the injuries she had the beatings that she sustained and for me despite it all like the one thing that always sticks in my head is these children are crying and no one ever comes. Um, it makes me so sad to think like they're crying in the beginning because they believe that somebody is going to stop people from hurting them. Um, and I was reading today about Isabella Wilden, Wilden who is the little girl who's been killed um, by her mum's new boyfriend when her mum allowed it to happen. And in court today, her mum's on stand for the third day. And her mum said, it's weird because the last couple of times he beat the shit out of her, she didn't even react like she was used to it. Because um, she learned that you as her fucking mother didn't come. When she cried and when these things happened to her, you didn't fucking save her. So she stopped bothering wasting the tears because she knew. She knew there was no point crying no more because it happened so many times and you did nothing. So she become used to it and children don't children cry right when they're born they're crying okay they cry when they're hungry when they need their bum changed and when they want to be cuddled by their mum or their dad but after a certain amount of period when they're crying because they're hungry and you're not coming they just stop because it's like a learned behavior it's a cry but they don't just cry if if they're not getting that reaction from their parents and isabella wilden was being beaten so severely over the last weeks of her life that she just stopped and most tormentors of children get frustrated because they're not getting the reaction so the beatings get worse until a child dies and it's um you know i was i was following isabella whelan throughout the trial at the same time i was doing sarah sharif and i had to just give it a break from it because i couldn't cover both at the same time um because the things the mums admitted on the stand to allow him to happen and she says well I didn't want to get involved because I thought that he might kill me. So he killed your daughter instead. You absolute fucking selfish bitch. And she admitted in court today, yeah.